I'm Osman Bilgi from Middle East Technical University, Ankara, and I think I'm holding the most fresh PhD degree among everyone else here. I got my degree last week, and this is the first time I'm writing it next to my name. So, um, uh, in my dissertation, I mean, this uh, whole thing comes from a philosophical view that I defended to in my dissertation and tried to develop in my dissertation. I call it epistemic constructivism. It's a version of constructivism. So I'll talk about uh, the notion of infinitesimals and infinitesimals as numbers from this perspective. Um, the outline of the talk is as follows. Now I will introduce for the unfamiliar people here. Uh, I will just uh, make a brief introduction regarding the origins of the infinitesimals, and then I'll discuss two metaphorical accounts. One is a basic metaphor infinity, uh, and the other one is process object metaphor. And um, as uh, the notion of infinity plays a core role that ties um, infinitesimals and uh, Cantorian ordinals, I'll talk about uh, how they uh, explain the construction of the ordinals, Cantorian ordinals and uh, infinitesimals. And then I'll talk, uh, present my view about the constructions of the Cantorian ordinals and infinitesimals. So uh, to begin with the ordinals, origins of the infinitesimals, it's the basic, most basic definition is that uh, an infinitesimal is a number that is bigger than zero, larger than zero, but small, smaller than all positive real numbers. So here's an example. We have uh, infinitely many uh, zeros after the decimal point in the example. And uh, the history, I mean, regarding the history of infinitesimals, we have a very, very huge history. I mean, we can go uh, far back to Zen of Elia. And the basic idea uh, is the uh, relationship between the between a finite interval and an, in, an interval that approaches to zero, but um, that does not uh, can, um, turn into zero. So, um, for a visual explanation, uh, here. Uh, one of the basic um, origins of this uh, infinitesimals is the uh, calculation of the area of a circle. The easiest way of doing this is uh, dividing the circle into um, many tiny bits of triangles, but the base part of the base side of the triangle must be a line, and we have a circle at hand to be calculated. Um, so. Uh, in figure two, you see a, a blank little tiny place right at the bottom of the blue um, uh, triangle. So uh, that was the part to be calculated. Um, Newton and Leibniz um, separately, they discovered or invented um, or created whichever uh, part you take on Benacerov's um, integration problem. Um, they they came up with the idea of infinitesimals, uh, but uh, after Cauchy and Weierstrass uh, and their introduction of the concept of limit, uh, mathematicians did not bother themselves with infinitesimals anymore because they were too small to uh, put into account. But there were some other people, especially physicists and uh, other scientists, they said, well, we have to use this because despite that they are too small they are not equal to zero so uh, robinson in 1960s developed non-standard analysis and uh, put these infinitesimals back into the uh, mathematics so starting with the basic metaphor infinity here um, i need to tell you that the word metaphor sounds like a term that comes from literature but indeed, its uh, Greek origins uh, are about the um, structure. I mean, we uh, abstract a structure out of a um, 
a mathematical uh, structure and then we apply the um, structure and we, we use it as a source domain and we apply it to the target domain. So um, generally, I mean, most of the metaphorical accounts defend to be uh, constitutive of their target domains. I mean, they are accounts that provide source domains and they defend that their source domains are constitutive. Uh, of their target domains that is without their source domains they cannot i mean no one can uh, construct a target domain and here is an uh, explanation regarding the infinitesimals uh, by Lakoff and Nunez um, you don't need to read the whole thing here the basic idea is this um, we have a beginning state zero and then we have a process I mean, here in this case, we are dividing. Uh, we are doing a division. I mean, and then uh, we are doing this infinitely many times, and at the end we have a final resultant state. Uh, these final resultant states are at the bottom of the um, chart, and uh, when it comes to the um, contouring ordinals. Uh, let me just uh, pass to the next slide. Um, we have the similar structure. Uh, we have a beginning state and we have a um, process that goes on and on inf infinitely many times. And we have a final resultant state. Uh, this is the basic uh, way that they explain uh, infinities in general. I mean, what I'm talking about is their basic metaphor of infinity, and we have different uh, types of infinities exemplified here, like, and the difference is the infinitely many steps they all uh, contain. And coming to the process object metaphor, it's developed by Panzer, and there are many names who influenced him, and uh, like Gray and Tolsfart and Dubinsky, and uh, he mainly is influenced by the uh, word, I mean, term perceptual thinking uh, developed by Gray and Tol. Perceptual, uh, as a word, percept, the pro part of the percept comes from process, and sept comes from the concept. So, in a way, they combine process and concept into a one single word percept. So, that means we are treating processes as objects of mathematics. So um, when compared, BMI has a leap and uh, that leap is between the final resultant state and the uh, infinitely many steps that uh, lead us to the final resultant state. I mean, imagine that we are, for example, counting um, and we started by one and we added one and one more, one more, one more, and we are getting two and three and four and five. We are going to infinity. But the problem is that whatever we do, I mean, we, uh, no matter how much we uh, repeat the same step, I mean, adding one, we are getting just another natural number. We are not getting out of this set of natural numbers. Uh, the explanation that they give does not explain how we just get out of the set of, I mean, what step, by exactly what step we get out of this natural number set and uh, we treat it as an object of mathematics. And uh, regarding POM, um, we do not have its application to higher ordinals. I mean, uh, I think PONs are successfully explains the construction of uh, first ordinal number omega, but he does not extend his views um, to the infinitesimals or the higher ordinals. So um, when compared with these uh, metaphorical accounts, I defend a view that I call this epistemic constructivist uh, perspective. Regarding the uh, integration problem, uh, it's on the constructive side of the uh, integration problem. And I focus on the cognitive, linguistic, epistemic, or associative abilities. But these abilities, I think, play a core role. And they are constitutive of both metaphors 
and uh, mathematical objects, the constructions of mathematical objects than metaphors. And um, I do not assume an ideal explanation or ideal mathematician. We are all able to use our abilities to do mathematics at, and we are able to use our abilities at different degrees. I mean, um, it takes, for example, for me a couple of days to figure out a mathematical structure, uh, but maybe it takes just a couple of uh, minutes for Ramanujan to understand the same mathematical structure. It's not because we are using different um, abilities. I think it's because we are using the same abilities at different levels. So, uh, and this also, I think, um, um, avoiding an ideal explanation or ideal mathematician uh, also avoids uh, uh, possible psychologies and criticisms. Um, and uh, I do not assume any mind independence in the mind independent existence for the mathematical objects. Uh, so in the, in this specific case, I mean case of uh, the infinitesimals, is the higher order thinking that uh, takes the lion's lion's share in the explanation of the construction of the infinitesimals and the explanation regarding the representation of the notion of infinitesimals. So. Um, just one more thing to, I think, mention is that I think why Panzer does not apply uh, his, I think, notable idea to the higher ordinals is that he does not focus on the way uh, Cantor uh, constructed his um, uh, ordinals. So, uh, in a way, what I'm trying to do is just get in, into, into the minds of the people who first introduced these uh, mathematical concepts. And uh, Cantor did this, I mean, uh, constructed his ordinals in, in by three principles. So, these principles will uh, play a role in the explanation regarding the construction of the uh, infinitesimals. So, I will just uh, first try to explain these. Um, first three principles and their roles in uh, the construction of the uh, transfinite ordinals, and then I'll proceed into the infinitesimals. So the first principle is very simple. We are just adding one, that's it. And um, so here at the upper line, we have plus one, plus one, and plus one, and we are just getting to the next uh, natural number. Uh, that's all. Uh, uh, that um, the first principle of generation serves for. When it comes to the second one, it's a great one, uh, actually. Now, in the example, you'll see that uh, there are two parts, which one, uh, one is highlighted in yellow and the other, others are highlighted in uh, blue. So all the steps that are highlighted in yellow are carried out by the use of the first principle of generation. We are just adding one in all um, uh, highlight uh, in all uh, series highlighted in yellow. But the um, blue ones are revolutionary. I mean that's the uh, basic. Uh, contribution of counter to the uh, to mathematics because he did this by um, um, higher order thinking he treated the process of for example one uh, just look at the first uh, very first line in the example uh, just counting there is just adding one that's the process and uh, he treats this adding one and adding one infinitely times, infinitely many times, as a process, and he calls that process a omega. And then he continues the uh, first uh, first principle of generation, and he uh, generates uh, numbers uh, further on. But he then again applies the second uh, principle of generation for the second time and gets two omega. And when he applies the same um, principle, he gets three omega. It goes on like this, but he has a um, he has another um, principle of generation, which is the third one. So, uh, in the 
case within the circle, we are using two different um, principles of generations in turn. And he treats this uh, use of two principles of generations in turn um, as, a, uh, as an object of mathematics. And he then continues to apply the first principle of generation and then the second one, and then goes on to do uh, a third one too. So um, this was the um, this this was the uh, basic way that Cantor could do what he did. And when we uh, look at the infinitesimals, I mean the connection between the constructions of the ordinals and the infinitesimals, we see that um, any infinitesimal is a second order object. That's what I claim. So. Here is a um, formula that defines a um, infinitesimal. This formula simply says that we are doing one thing and uh, dividing uh, a number k by 10. And we are doing this division infinitely many times. So uh, in the case here, if uh, k is one, we have the um, we have zero point, and after the decimal point, we have infinitely many zeros, and then one. But uh, I think infinitesimals is about what can we think of, like Zen, like as in as in uh, Zeno's thought experiments, because despite that physicists continued to use infinitesimals in their calculations, the smallest thing or the smallest size in physics is uh expressed uh by Planck length and it is um not a um infinitesimal so i mean we are actually when we are talking about infinitesimals i don't think that we are talking about specs or uh, little 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 very little tiny subatomic things but we are talking about um, what can we construct uh, that is infinitely small in size and expressible by mathematical terms. So here, um, I think uh, it's important to note that uh, despite that this um, infinity symbol is used uh, that I uh, wrote in red, it is used in calculus, but I think it should be explained, and uh, that explanation I think uh, is related to the construction of the um, contouring uh, ordinal numbers. Here I have a cardinal case, and this uh, is an example that shows that we, if we take this infinity as a, as some sort of a uh, infinity that is cardinal in essence, we have some bizarre conclusions. So. Um, the example is that when we divide the um, zero, uh, sorry, the number a by two, we have um, an infinitesimal uh, whose last decimal is five. But um, if we take it, I mean, if, if we ask how many zeros after the decimal points are there, and if we answer that question by a cardinal number like Aleph zero, we would be in contradiction because uh, the result is bigger than the number divided and uh, we cannot show this on um, um, cardinal, uh, I mean, true cardinal numbers because despite that we add there one more zero uh, that I uh, wrote in green, uh, Aleph zero plus one is still Aleph zero. So technically there is no change in size. So uh, that takes us to the contradiction that, uh, that's expressed in the last line. On the one hand, B becomes bigger than A, and on the other hand, two times B becomes equal to A, which is a contradiction. So this is not how it's generally interpreted. I just wanted to put this example because uh, most of the time people um, start their calculus lessons or uh, by an by a word that defines um, 
um, internet is most counterintuitive. I think if they are counterintuitive, it's the intuition that takes this um, um, infinity uh, cardinal in essence. I, I mean, that's the basic intuition that contradicts with the uh, infinitesimals as numbers. So when we compare it with the ordinals, here we interpret this uh, infinity sign as some sort of a um, ordinal number. Let's say that it's omega plus five. So when we divide this number a by two, we get um, um, another infinity small with one more zero after the decimal point. That that is there are omega plus six zeros, which makes the number smaller. And uh, so uh, there is no contradiction and there is no counterintuitivity in um, interpreting this um, infinity sign as a sort of um, ordinal number. Besides, uh, ordinal numbers, as you know, does not uh, they do not annul things in infinity. And here we have uh, ordering different infinity smalls and uh, as you can see there are three numbers i mean we cannot say that the set of all or infinity smalls is some sort of a um, well-ordered set because we for, for the definition of well-orderedness we need a smallest element uh, which we lack in infinity smalls but if we define a set with um uh, different elements of infinitesimals, uh, and if we are able to say how many time, how many zeros are there after the um, uh, decimal point, and if we can express that in um, ordinal numbers, we can literally um, order them without getting into any counterintuitive position or uh, contradiction. So. Uh, in the cardinal sense, these all these numbers uh, have different um, positions when they are ordered, but when they are ordered in the sense uh, when they are ordered um, in the case that the infinity sign is interpreted as a cardinal as an ordinal value, then we have a uh, true uh, ordering here. And uh, coming to the um, the notion of infinitesimals is about representation. So, um, for a, any number k, what we are doing is division by 10, and we are um, doing, uh, we are treating this operation as a, a process of, as a uh, concept or object of mathematics. And uh, the notion of infinit infinitesimals is uh, not an object, but um, it's a um, third order or a higher order notion, if you prefer to call it so. So we are just getting one step higher and we are just looking at these uh, all different and possible acts of um, dividing by 10 infinitely many times. And we are treating this as a and we are representing infinitesimals uh, as a uh, third order um, concept uh, or in a third order concept. Uh, so um, thank you, I guess that's all. Uh, I guess I have uh, exceeded my time a little bit, but uh, so I think I could finish it. Thank you so much for the talk. We have uh, six minutes for questions, and in fact, I already have a question. So, uh, what is the constructive meaning of a process which um, which is done infinitely many times? Is it a kind of Brouwer's choice sequence that is kind of law-like sequence, or, or what? Um, so, um, you are asking this. Um, um, I could not just get the, uh, the first couple of uh, words at the beginning of the question. Uh, so constructions or construction steps. Uh, 
the constructive meaning. Uh, what is the constructive meaning of a process which is done infinitely many times? Um, uh, that, I, is, uh, that is, uh, how can we constructively reach, for example, the least limit or ordinal? Uh, well, let me uh, explain it this way. So, if no one is going to ask anything about the, I mean, in the um, um, uh, slides, I will just uh, stop sharing. Uh, so, if there is any other questions regarding slides, I may just go back to the slides. Now, this um, process object metaphor is plays a uh, basic role in my explanation, but um, there are a couple of points that could be made, but let me explain it this way, uh, without getting maybe uh, deeper into the unrelated parts. Um, this uh, basic point is that how we are able to uh, conceptualize, I mean, represent infinity or understand infinity or talk about infinity in a concept. I mean, we are talking about infinity regard regardless of being able to um, uh, identify infinity in experience. So uh, think, think of, for example, um, Hilbert's Grand Hotel or uh, Orden Arithmetic or a little kid who learns, for example, how to count and asks his father, how far does that go? And he says till infinity and he goes on to count like infinity plus one, infinity plus two. So we are, ha we, we do have that concept. So the explanations must target how we are able to construct that um, concept. So I think at that point, uh, and uh, at that point, I think we have this second order thinking at work. Cantor did this that way, I think, and um, the explanations that I read do not uh, direct any, I mean, they do not uh, take any reader to the bro variant series or uh, such stuff, but to this, um, um, second order thinking because Kantor himself says uses Herrasch Steffen in German stepping out of the series but stepping out of the series I mean is another is some other um, act that is uh, I mean different from the act that keeps us within the series like adding one and adding one and adding one so we are just going one step above the process and we are treating that process as a um, concept. The innovative part of Cantor's work was um, treating that concept as a mathematical object. So here in this case, in the case of infinitesimals, we are um, doing, I mean, basically one simple thing, dividing a number by 10, and we are doing this infinitely many times. So in any infinitesimal, I mean, infinitesimal, it's, I'm talking about a, an infinitesimal number, we are uh, doing this um, um, by treating that process as an object. So each and every infinitesimal becomes a second order, second order object, like each and every um, transfinite ordinal number. Uh, so I don't know if I answered your question correctly, but um, as far as I understood you, your question um, was about uh, what I said, but if I'm not, please uh, correct me. Yes, thank you. And as you can see, Alexei Konovalov wants to ask a question. Alexei, please. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, could you um, show me again uh, the slide with the uh, blank length, please? Okay. Uh, 
Um, yes. Um, just let me open up the uh, first one so that. This plan works. Huh? Mm -hmm. This plan, plan thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, excuse me, what is uh, the unit of measurement? Um, this plan that you missed, right? Yes, Planck length. What is the unit of measurement? This Planck length, length is uh, the, um, I think, smallest um, size that can uh, a physical object can take. Or, I mean, this is the, um, I mean, the smallest, I mean, size of, the, I mean, it, when we think of the smallest size, uh, the, the, uh, the object with the smallest size, that's the size of the... Um... I, I, I see, I know, I see. I mean, what is um, this number in uh, what units of measurement? Number. Ah, huh, sorry. Micrometer, meter, nanometer, what is it? It's, it, it's meter as far as I know. Okay. okay. We should... Uh, you should use um, the unit of measurement because uh, without them, it's just a um, nonsensical number. Yeah, you're right. I was just focusing on the number part too much. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you, Osman, for the talk. Um,